Cedar Point's Millennium Force shocked the world when it opened in 2000 as the world's first complete circuit roller coaster to top 300 feet. To this day, it's still arguably one of the world's most famous roller coasters. But as much as I love Millennium, I can't help but admit that something about it just isn't the same. Something that I consider a major downside. And no, it doesn't have to do with the ride experience. In fact, I find that Millennium Force runs better than ever. Shouts out to the Cedar Point maintenance team. My rides in 2022 were smoother than my first rides in 2010, back when it still ran with stainless steel bodies on its trains. The fiberglass bodies that were added in 2015 are slightly lighter and don't vibrate at all as the train runs the track. My rides in May of this year were also quite fast and I found the trains to quickly run the track as if it were a hot day in August. But what has changed for the worse is the ride's operations, meaning you will wait much longer in line for Millennium Force compared to years past. For context, Millennium Force used to consistently average about 1.7 million riders a year. But in 2021, the ride did just over 1 million riders, and from what I've seen so far this year, things aren't looking to improve. Between 1.7 million and 1 million riders, that's a roughly 42% drop in ridership and I don't believe Cedar Point has seen a 42% drop in attendance, meaning your chances of riding the coaster when you visit are technically slimmer. Of course, there's a lot of factors that cause this enormous drop, like the park having fewer operating hours than in the past, but one of them isn't the ride being significantly less popular. Personally, I don't think this is okay, and hopefully you'll understand why at the end of this video. Let's take an in-depth look at the operations of Millennium Force, something you may not think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Also, I'd like to thank you all for 100,000 subscribers. This is truly monumental to me and your support has been very much appreciated. Let me start by giving you all a background on how Millennium Force is meant to operate. This 310 foot tall roller coaster can run three 36 passenger trains on its 6,595 foot long track and is capable of dispatching at most 36 trains every hour. This means the ride has a theoretical capacity of 1,296 riders per hour if every seat on every train is filled with a rider. While this seems like a high number, it's lower than the major roller coasters Cedar Point built beforehand. Raptor, which opened in 1994, is capable of 1,728 riders per hour. And Magnum XL200, which opened in 1989, was originally capable of 1,692 riders per hour. Millennium's limitation can mainly be attributed to the ride's elevator cable lift and block zones. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a block zone is a section of ride that only one train may occupy. At the end of a block zone is the method to stop a train in case the block zone ahead is still occupied. This is the safety system that prevents roller coaster trains from colliding with one another. Here we have the block zone diagram of Millennium Force. Its block zones are as follows. First, we have the load station block zone, followed by the lift hill block zone. Starting at the crest of the lift hill, we enter this long block zone that encompasses the entire ride layout all the way to the ride's waiting break zone right before the unload station. This is the waiting block zone. And then last is the unload station block zone. So a simple set of four block zones that allow Millennium Force to run three trains. Now Millennium's final break run is split into two sections. First is the long trim section, immediately following the final overbank turn that bleeds off most of each train's speed. Then following a slight bend to the right is the waiting break that can stop a train. You might think this means the ride should have five block zones like this, but that's not the case. The trim section features fixed magnetic brakes, and magnetic brakes on their own are not capable of fully stopping a coaster train. A block zone must end with what's called a control point, which is a place where a train can be stopped. The waiting brake is thus the end of the block zone since it features tire drives that physically contact the train. These tire drives act as the control point and can bring trains to a full stop after the movable magnetic brakes in this location have slowed the train to a crawl. Unlike other rides like Raptor that also operate three trains, Millennium Force doesn't have what's called a mid-course brake run. This means there is no block zone along the coaster's long layout to split the main section of track into two block zones, which would allow two trains to be on the main section of track at once. Because of this, only one train on Millennium Force can be in the main section of track or waiting block zone at a time. So this means a train cannot fully exit the lift block into the ride's large waiting block zone until the train ahead has fully cleared the waiting block zone and fully entered the unload station block zone. While the long waiting block zone does limit the ride's capacity, it does mean your ride is uninterrupted by a random brake run or lift hill mid-ride. Luckily, the ride features what are called rolling blocks, which allow all trains to move at nearly the same time, rather than waiting for the block zone ahead to completely clear before the next train advances forward. 
When operating with three trains, once the train in the load station begins moving up the lift hill, the trains in the unload and waiting block zones will advance nearly simultaneously, which helps clear the waiting block zone before the train climbing the lift hill reaches the end of the lift block. So this is how the block zones limit Millennium's capacity. The other limiting factor is Millennium's elevator cable lift. Rather than having a continuous chain on its lift hill like most coasters, where trains can catch on at any point and be hoisted to the top, Millennium instead has a cable with what's called a catch car shown here. The catch car is what attaches to trains and hoists them to the top. But since there is only one catch car in the entire lift hill, the catch car must lift the train to the top and then return to the home position or base of the lift hill to collect the next train. Intamin went with an elevator cable lift for several reasons. One was because at the time, the weight of a chain needed to hoist a train 300 feet into the air would have been too much, and cables are far lighter. With the reduced weight, this allowed the cable lift to operate at a very high speed. Also due to the weight savings, it let the lift hill be steeper at 45 degrees, which helped the ride fit in the limited space available on the Cedar Point Peninsula. Now the cable lift is quick and operates at a top speed of 600 centimeters per second, or about 13.4 miles per hour. Intamin originally believed that with such a fast lift hill, the ride would be capable of 1,800 riders per hour, meaning the ride would be able to dispatch 50 trains an hour, which is a dispatch every 72 seconds. But what Intamin didn't properly account for was the ride's block zones that force a longer minimum dispatch interval. If the ride were to dispatch every 72 seconds, a train would stop at the top of the lift hill every cycle because the train ahead would not have cleared the end of the waiting block zone. This is called a setup. And while the cable lift can operate at a high maximum speed, it's slow when it comes to other aspects. When dispatching a train from the load station, the cable lift adds about 9 seconds to this process compared to most other coasters that immediately leave the station once the operators hit the dispatch buttons. Upon pressing dispatch at Millennium, the catch car takes about 3 seconds to slowly move backwards and position itself correctly underneath car 4 of the 9 car train. Then the gates in front of the train swing open as the catch car slowly inches forward until it contacts the catch dog underneath car 4. Then it accelerates and quickly takes the train up the lift hill. This 9 second delay eats into the load and unload time of the coaster since if you want to hit the minimum interval time, you must press dispatch 9 seconds earlier than on most coasters. And as a former ride operator, trust me, when you're loading trains quickly, every second counts. When the catch car drops the train into the first drop and returns to the station, it quickly moves back down the lift at 600 centimeters per second, but slows down immensely when it returns to the station, most likely so that it doesn't damage the train sitting in the load station if it were to somehow make contact with the train. You can see it slowly inching into place, and since the catch car is so long, this takes a good amount of time. Once it finally does stop, the dispatch sequence can begin. Simultaneously, the train running the course will be flying over the speed hill adjacent to the station. If you press dispatch now, the roughly 9 second delay means the train running the course has an extra 9 seconds to make its way to the end of the waiting block. So once the train dispatching from the station starts heading up the lift, the train ahead will exit the waiting block in time to avoid a setup. So this is how we get Millennium's actual minimum interval time at 100 seconds, and that's for two reasons. One is that the cable lift takes 100 seconds to fully cycle, meaning it can lift the train to the top every 100 seconds. And then the other factor is the massive waiting block zone that requires ample time for a train to clear. Together, the two work hand in hand and the timing works out perfectly. So this is how we get the ride's true theoretical capacity of 36 dispatches per hour and 1,296 riders. The ride simply can't dispatch any faster. And funny enough, Intamin still advertises that Millennium is capable of 1,650 riders per hour on their website. I'd love to hear the reasoning behind this. When Cedar Point realized Millennium Force's true capacity during its opening year in 2000, the park wasn't happy at all. Being such a capacity-driven amusement park, it was the norm for ride crews to safely churn through as many waiting guests as possible, with many rides operating at their theoretical maximum capacities hour after hour and achieving over 2 million riders a year. After all, Cedar Point was and still is a very popular amusement park where its main rides almost always feature a long line. So running at a good capacity ensured that guests spent the least amount of time in line and got on as many rides as possible. Cedar Point even used to post the annual ridership of their major attractions on their website. It was a huge indication that the park was serious about capacity. Here we have the annual ridership numbers of Raptor. Here we have Magnums. And then here are Geminis, which up until about the early 2000s ran 6 trains in total with 3 trains on each track. Even Corkscrew used to run 3 trains, and when it had no seatbelts would do 1700 riders an hour. 
Then Cedar Point went on to purchase Gemini, Iron Dragon, and Magnum XL200 from Aerodynamics purposely without the ability to double stack. Meaning if one train was still in the station loading riders, the second train could stop behind the station and wait for the station to clear, but if things got held up further, the third train couldn't quote unquote properly stop on the track. If the rides did stack their third train, they would stop at an emergency control point and set up. For these rides, that meant they essentially broke down, and this forced good operations. In fact, Millennium Force was originally designed to only run two trains, but Cedar Point told Intamin that it absolutely needed to run three. So Intamin simply added the unload station and inserted this infamous straight track to push the last overbank turnout further, which provided the extra room to fit the unload station. Technically, the unload station doesn't boost Millennium's theoretical capacity. The ride would still be capable of cycling 36 trains an hour, but it does make it easier to consistently achieve the ride's theoretical capacity, at least when the ride has all three trains on the track. Two train operations on this ride is a different story. The unload station means trains enter the load station already empty and no time needs to be wasted in the load station to unload riders. Guests with exit or ADA passes are also boarded at the unload station which avoids holdups that would normally happen when this process takes place on the load station. In 2000, Millennium hit 1,735,347 riders, which was honestly exceptional considering the ride would often run with two or even one train that year. Back then, the wheels on the trains would wear out far too quickly and trains would need to be removed from the track constantly to have wheels replaced. This issue would later be fixed once new wheel compounds were developed that could handle the ride's high speeds and long layout. In 2001, the now reliable Millennium Force hit its highest ever annual number, 1,954,163 riders. And then afterwards, like I mentioned earlier, the ride has consistently averaged about 1.7 million riders a year. Beating the 2001 ridership number would be nearly impossible due to new safety protocols that ride hosts must follow, and a reduction in the number of staff working Millennium Force. For instance, ride hosts in the load station used to be able to give their all-clear signal as soon as they had checked their seats and while walking back to their safety positions. Nowadays, after checking all seats, ride hosts must first walk back to their safety positions and visually check the restraints they just checked. And then all ride hosts must be in a safety position before an all-clear signal can be given, which adds more time to the load process. In addition, the unload station originally had no gates at its exit points, but now there are two magnetic gates that must be checked by a ride host before the unload station can give their all-clear. And there also used to be an additional ride host at the unload station who would work on the narrow side of the platform to check restraints for any guests who loaded from the exit. As far as I know, that position was cut years ago, and now only the ride host on the main side of the unload station checks the train when guests board from the exit which means it takes longer to board a larger group from the exit. When running three trains, a delay in the unload station also causes a delay to dispatching from the load station, as both the load station and unload station must be ready to dispatch together. During two train operations though, the stations operate independently. But even so, for nearly two decades, ride crews have operated Millennium at or near its minimum interval time. As a guest waiting in line, you knew the ride was doing so if the train rolling through the waiting break zone before the unload station never stopped moving. This basically meant the ride crew was running at or near interval and achieving well over 30 trains an hour. But then things took a turn for the worse. In 2021, Millennium Force only did 1,016,764 riders. Now granted, Cedar Point did have a lot less operating hours in 2021 compared to a year like 2001, but we're still looking at a nearly 48% reduction in ridership when comparing those years. And when compared to the average 1.7 million riders a year, an over 40% reduction in ridership. That's a major decline, especially for a busy and bustling amusement park that used to be so focused on safely getting as many people on their rides as possible. Now there's several reasons for this massive reduction. I briefly worked at Millennium Force as a ride operator in the fall of 2018, and that's sort of where our story begins. I began my training in August of 2018, and right beforehand, Millennium began having pretty major issues with its lift motor. Up until that point, the ride was known for being rather reliable, a ride you could pretty much always count on for being open. But suddenly, the ride would remain closed for half each day, or some days it wouldn't even open at all. The ride computer would throw an error saying, lift drive not okay, and that's it. So no context about what was specifically wrong with the lift drive, just that it wasn't okay. And whenever this error occurred, the ride couldn't run. I think this went on for a few weeks, and the ride would run I guess whenever the lift drive was quote unquote okay. 
Eventually, the park's maintenance staff figured out that the lift motor needed to be replaced entirely, and they swapped Millennium's lift motor with a backup one. Now, the backup motor is weaker than the original. I'll explain what that means in a bit, but this was totally fine in the moment, since ordering the ride a new lift motor would have apparently cost 500,000 US dollars. And on top of that, the park would have to wait for that motor to be manufactured and then delivered, which could take weeks or even longer. So with the backup motor being weaker, it hoisted trains up the lift hill at a slower speed. Normally, the top speed is 600 centimeters per second, but the backup motor can only run at 450 centimeters per second, or about 10 miles an hour. Like I mentioned earlier, Millennium Force has an elevator cable lift rather than a traditional chain. Because of this, the speed the lift motor operates at has even more of an effect on Millennium's capacity than a normal roller coaster, because it's very dependent on how fast the catch car, or basically the elevator, can take a train to the top, and then how fast that elevator can get back down to the bottom to grab the next train. In the past with three train operations, the train would begin to ascend the lift hill at 450 centimeters per second until the train in the waiting brake fully entered the unload station. Then the train climbing the lift hill would speed up to the full 600 centimeters per second, which would occur about two thirds of the way up the lift. After dumping the train into the drop, the lift motor would then return the catch car to the bottom at 600 centimeters a second. And then during two train operations with the original lift motor, if the second train was parked in the unload station, the train dispatching from the load station would immediately leave at 600 centimeters per second because the waiting block zone was clear. Then the catch car would return to the station at 600 centimeters a second to pick up the next train. But now with the backup motor and two train operations, trains only climb the lift at 450 centimeters per second, regardless of the number of trains on the track. And the catch car also returns to the bottom at 450 centimeters per second instead of 600 centimeters per second, a 25% reduction in top speed. Like I mentioned earlier, the original lift motor could hoist the train to the top every 1 minute and 40 seconds. But with the slower backup motor, it now takes the cable lift 2 minutes to cycle. And this is the new minimum dispatch interval. So instead of 36 trains an hour, the new max is 30, meaning a maximum of 1,080 riders per hour. And while still a downgrade, honestly, 30 trains an hour isn't completely terrible. It means a 17% reduction in theoretical capacity. And just for the record, four years later in 2022, the lift hill has still not been sped back up to full speed. So if the slower lift motor is only reducing Millennium's capacity by 17%, what's with the average 40% reduction in ridership? It's not because there aren't enough people lining up for the ride. While Valraven and Steel Vengeance have certainly pulled away some crowds, Millennium is still one of Cedar Point's most popular roller coasters and almost always has a line. Like I mentioned earlier, one of the major factors is definitely the reduced operating hours in Cedar Point's schedule. Well besides that, a big part of the ridership drop is unfortunately due to the operating crew. From what I've seen, it seems like a mix of some crew members not being motivated or trained well enough to hit the minimum dispatch interval. And I don't mean to be harsh, as I've met a few of Millennium's crew members in 2021 and 2022, and you guys were all awesome people. I'm just looking out for everyone's best interest and would love to see you all take things to the next level. In the past, it was common for ride crews to operate at or near the 1 minute 40 second interval time cycle after cycle. The goal was that a train should never fully stop in the waiting break, which was a great visible way to keep the crew on target. And often, the ride would average 34 to even a perfect 36 dispatches an hour, yielding an average of about 1150 riders per hour when accounting for empty seats. But the slower lift motor extends the minimum dispatch interval by 20 seconds, so it's now 2 minutes. So if the ride crew still loaded and unloaded guests at the same rate as they did in the past, they should have more than ample time to hit the 2 minute interval time every dispatch. So in my harsh opinion, it's kind of inexcusable that the ride crew isn't hitting this new slower interval time. Especially considering that crews in the past were trained well enough to hit the faster interval time consistently. So in the current case, Millennium's crew should have trains loaded and unloaded with time to spare, and should be waiting for the catch car to park in the home position every cycle. But from what I've seen, the dispatches have been averaging much longer than that. So why don't I show you? Let's run the Cedar Point live webcam for a bit and record some dispatches at Millennium Force. And while we wait for our results, here's a brief message from our video sponsor, Exter. Exter produces the world's slimmest and smartest wallets like this one right here, the Exter Parliament Wallet. It's made of premium Italian leather that puts a regular bifold wallet to shame. It's super slim, so it's perfect for amusement parks and features Exter's signature quick card access. 
which lets you grab a credit card with ease, especially when you're at Six Flags Great Adventure and need to buy a locker for El Toro, one of the best upcharge attractions in the world. Exter Smart Wallets can also be paired with Exter's Tracker Card, a smart accessory that helps you keep track of your wallet. Pair it with the Chipolo app, available on iOS and Android, and you can see the location of your wallet or ring your wallet from your smartphone. You can even use the tracker card to ring your smartphone if you misplace that. The tracker card is solar powered and just two hours in the sun yields three months of battery life. There's also the extra aluminum card holder, an even slimmer version of the Parliament wallet with quick card access. Its thinner design is even better for an amusement park and it can still hold the extra tracker card. And both wallets feature built-in RFID protection. I'm absolutely loving my extra products and I never want to go back to a regular bifold wallet again. Be sure to use my discount link in the description below and get your own extra gear. The link will get you an additional 5% off on top of the 20% off July 4th sale and promotion right now. So a total of 25% off until July 5th. Place your orders today. All right, let's review Millennium's operations. This hour was recorded on June 13th of 2022. I'm going to speed up the footage and time how often a train dispatches. I'll use this location here as my marker so I know where to time from. So in one hour with three trains on the track, Millennium dispatched a total of 21 trains with an average dispatch time of two minutes and 47 seconds. 21 trains multiplied by 36 riders per train yields a theoretical capacity of 756 riders. And then when accounting for empty seats, probably a realistic capacity closer to 670 riders, which is a nearly 42% drop from the old average of about 1150 riders per hour. And then this hour was recorded on June 3rd, 2022, and with three trains on the track, saw only 20 trains dispatched, with an average cycle time of 2 minutes and 54 seconds. This yields a theoretical capacity of 720 riders per hour and a more realistic capacity of about 640 when accounting for empty seats. So an over 44% drop from the old average of 1150 riders per hour. Then this hour was recorded on June 20th, 2022. With three trains on the track, the ride dispatched 24 trains with an average dispatch time of 2 minutes and 28 seconds. This yields a theoretical capacity of 864 riders and a more realistic 770 riders per hour. And then this hour was recorded on June 21st, 2022 and saw the same 24 dispatches. Averaging these four hours together, I get roughly 22 trains an hour. So an average theoretical capacity of 792 riders and a realistic capacity of about 704 riders per hour. And then for comparison, this is a 14 minute video of Millennium operating on June 30th, 2016 via a webcam recording by Amusement 420. In just 14 minutes, the Millennium crew dispatches eight trains at an average rate of one minute and 41 seconds only one second longer than the ride's theoretical minimum interval, which basically yields a perfect 36 trains an hour, meaning a theoretical capacity of 1,296 riders, the 100% potential, and a more realistic capacity of about 1,150 riders per hour, which was the old average. So between 36 trains and 22 trains an hour, that's a nearly 39% drop. Let's pretend the ride operates for a 14 hour day. 22 trains with its realistic capacity of 704 riders per hour yields 9,856 riders for the day, and 36 trains with its realistic capacity of 1,150 riders per hour yields 16,100 riders for the day. If there are over 30,000 people in the park, operating at full capacity means over half the guests in attendance can ride Millennium, while 700 riders per hour means less than one third of the guests get to ride. And with Millennium operating at a lower capacity, it means two additional things. Either the line will consistently be longer, or guests will not want to wait and will fill up the lines at other rides, making those lines longer. Let's say there are 1150 people waiting in line, and let's also say that Fastlane doesn't exist right now. With 1150 people in line, this would normally be a one hour wait when Millennium runs at 1150 riders per hour. But at just 700 riders per hour, the same 1150 people waiting in the queue is now a nearly one hour and 40 minute wait. If the demand for Millennium Force is still the same 1150 riders per hour, meaning that many guests are lining up to ride each hour, the queue will grow longer to probably well over two hours. Or more realistically, a balancing act will begin to happen where the demand to queue up for Millennium will drop because guests will see how long its line is and they'll opt to ride another ride instead. This will send guests to other attractions to fill up the lines at other rides. And guests that decide to wait for Millennium will now miss the opportunity to ride other attractions because of the extra wait. Call me El Toro Karen, but I really don't like this. 
Millennium used to be a ride I could count on for having a line that would move steadily. In the same hour that Millennium dispatched 20 trains, Maverick dispatched 28 times from the station, meaning 56 trains cycled because Maverick dispatches two trains at a time. And there would have been more, but Maverick appeared to break down with about four and a half minutes left on the hour. So let's say a realistic 30 dispatches with 60 trains cycled. With Maverick's 12 passenger trains, that leads to a theoretical capacity of 720 riders an hour, the same that Millennium got that hour. For context, remember that Millennium has done over 1.9 million riders in a season, whereas Maverick, being a lower capacity ride by nature, has only done 1,180,439 riders in a single season. Also in the same hour, Steel Vengeance dispatched 32 trains. At some point, there was an over 6 minute pause between the pretty regular dispatch intervals, so the crew probably would have sent more trains had this not happened, maybe 35 trains. With its 24 passenger trains and 35 dispatches, Vengeance could have theoretically done 840 riders that hour. And even at the actual 32 dispatches, that's a theoretical 768 riders, more than Millennium 720 that hour. Now get this, while Steel Vengeance is a very popular ride, it has never done more than 1 million riders in a single season. As popular as a ride may be, its ridership is also highly dependent on how well the ride is operated. Vengeance's smaller trains that are constricting to larger guests make it challenging to hit high rider numbers. Meanwhile, here we have visible proof of it outperforming Millennium Force. And then just for fun, here is an hour of Magnum XL 200 running with three trains. This was recorded on June 17th, 2022. In this hour, the ride does 35 dispatches, and with its 36 passenger trains means a theoretical capacity of 1260 riders. Check out this cycle here where a setup occurs. The dispatch time this cycle was only 1 minute and 55 seconds, which still leads to a setup. Meanwhile, Millennium's minimum interval time is now 2 minutes, but not even that can be achieved. And which ride is more popular? Millennium. Now granted, the seatbelts on Millennium's trains are much shorter than on Magnum's trains, which makes it harder for larger guests to fit on Millennium, which can slow down operations when guests have trouble buckling their seatbelts or when they don't fit. But ride hosts at Millennium should be trained to quickly handle situations where riders may be too large to ride. Or if Millennium's seatbelts have been shortened further from years past, I think the seatbelt should be extended, as I don't think there's ever been an incident at Millennium regarding its restraints. I just don't understand how Cedar Point used to think Millennium Force's capacity was too low when it opened, and that was when it could pull 1200 riders an hour. And now between the slower lift motor and slower ride crew, they seem fine allowing the ride to run at 700 riders per hour. Millennium used to do some of the most riders in the entire park, and now it's clumped together with the lower capacity coasters like Maverick and Seal Vengeance. I really hope this is a temporary change and that management decides to get it back together. With the park having fewer operating hours, I think it's more important than ever that Millennium run at a higher capacity. Since the same number of people are visiting the park when hours were longer, and it betters your chances of riding more attractions on your visit. And something like this makes me question, does Cedar Point have too many roller coasters? When the park had exceptional operations in the past, there were less coasters, meaning there were less crews to manage and it was easier to staff the park. Nowadays, I know the park has trouble staffing the park to the minimum just to get by, whereas in the past, that wasn't an issue at all. And with less coaster crews, it meant that management could focus on those crews and give them the attention they needed. But with all sorts of different crews and less staff, it does make it harder to focus your attention on each crew. In 2015, Cedar Fair, who was the parent company of Cedar Point, adopted the International Ride Operator Certification, or IROC. IROC is the world's only third-party certification of ride operator safety, efficiency, and professionalism, and Cedar Fair hoped that adopting the policies and procedures at all their parks would help make their operations more consistent across their whole lineup, but it hasn't. And at Cedar Point, it's definitely put more of an emphasis on safety, which is fine, but when the park was more capacity focused, things were already safe. Like I mentioned earlier, in the past, ride hosts at Millennium could put an all clear signal up as soon as they had finished checking their restraints and while walking back to a designated location. IROC is the reason that ride hosts must now all be in a safety position before giving an all clear signal, and the rules with IROC have gotten stricter over the years. On top of that, pushing your ride crew to work too quickly can be considered unsafe even if your ride crew is capable of operating faster and still safely. As a former ride operator, I think IROC takes safety a little too far and adds additional complexity to what was already a safe system at Cedar Point. And from a guest standpoint, my experience at Cedar Point is diminished because of the slower and overly safe operations. The wait times at many rides like Millennium Forest have been extended and it makes accomplishing as many rides as possible in a single day at the park extremely challenging. 
Meanwhile, when I worked at Six Flags Great Adventure, Six Flags had IROC while I worked at the park in 2014 to 2016. But then in 2017, Six Flags dropped IROC in favor of pushing capacity at their parks instead. So things were reversed. In 2017, while working at El Toro, I no longer needed to wait for all ride hosts to arrive at a safety square before putting up an all clear. That along with many other changes made operations much faster and an excellent level of safety was still maintained. Meanwhile, the opposite has happened at Cedar Point. I say that Cedar Fair drop IROC entirely, but I have a feeling the company also utilizes IROC to lower their insurance rates. The same reason why Cedar Fair parks have added seatbelts to many rides that don't need them, like their various B&M Hyper and Giga Coasters, so we'll probably see IROC for many years to come. And I think the only way we'll see operations get faster with IROC is if ride crews have more staff on the platform. Say in the case of Millennium Force, if there are six attendants checking restraints in the load station rather than four. But then combine that with the staffing problem the park currently faces, which would make it nearly impossible to staff all their coasters to this extent. I say that Cedar Fair should take the route of Disney, Universal, and Six Flags parks and not use IROC, and make their own policies and procedures that are still safe but also influence good capacity. As far as the lift motor goes, this also has me scratching my head because I've seen other parks with intimate coasters get their lift motors replaced in the same season. For instance, El Toro at Six Flags Great Adventure is another intimate coaster that also runs an elevator cable lift. Its lift motor went bad around August of 2013, and within a month or so, a new lift motor was installed, and we never saw a reduction in speed in the process. Having worked at both Great Adventure and Cedar Point as a ride operator, I can tell you that while Great Adventure is capacity focused, they are less so than Cedar Point, at least back in 2018. So how come four years later in 2022, we still have no visible improvement to Millennium's lift motor? Are there simply too many roller coasters at Cedar Point to maintain? I heard that Millennium did have a new lift drive installed in May of this year, during the first few weeks of the season where the park was closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. The ride remained closed for another day or so beyond that and reopened with the lift still operating at 450 centimeters per second, not the full 600 centimeters per second. So it does make me wonder, if a new lift motor was installed, is it still weaker than the original motor? Or does the ride need to be reprogrammed to account for the new motor so that it operates at full speed again? Or are we just never going to see the full lift speed again? This ride is over 20 years old now. Oddly, Millennium was closed all day on June 15th and most of the day on June 16th. Maybe the park was performing work to get the new lift drive operating at full speed. As of June 24th when I'm recording this, while watching the webcams, I still see Millennium's lift operating at the slower speed. But even if the lift motor can't be fixed, it would be nice to see the ride at least operate at its new maximum capacity rather than the double downgrade we see now. The 2019 Millennium crew hit 1,284,902 riders, even with the slower lift hill, as I believe they were better about hitting the 2 minute interval time. While still much lower than the old 1.7 million, it's only a 24% drop versus the 40% drop with 2021's 1 million riders. And then this is a dream scenario of mine, but I think Millennium's load station should be reconfigured to account for better 2 or 1 train operations. When running less than three trains, the unload station should not be used, and guests should instead unload at the load station, just like how Time Traveler does at Silver Dollar City. It only uses its separate unload station with three trains on the track, and with two trains has riders unload in the load station instead. An unload station on a ride like Millennium only makes sense when a train stacks behind the load station for most of the time period a train is in the load station. Otherwise, with less than three trains on the track, the unload station instead becomes another time delay, since a train must first park on the unload station and complete the unload process, and then be advanced into the load station for the load process, rather than doing both processes at the same time. This way, Millennium would still be capable of 36 dispatches an hour with two trains, well now 30 dispatches thanks to the slower lift motor, and not running with the unload station would mean the ride needs less staff to operate which helps the park's staffing issues. Now this would require expanding the far side of the load station to give room for riders to unload, as well as creating access to that side of the station for riders to exit down or for guests with exit or ADA passes to come up. Which is why this is more of a dream scenario to me, because I don't see the park ever spending the money on that if they can't can't get the lift motor back to regular operation. But it would be nice because I often see Millennium not operating with all three trains for one reason or another. Anyway, that will do it for this video. I hope you guys learned something new, and comment down below if you have also noticed the downgrade in Millennium Force's operations. While I only started visiting Cedar Point in 2010, I'm sure many of you have witnessed how well the operations at the park used to be in the past, and hopefully that can come back. I know staffing has been a major issue and hopefully Cedar Point can get that sorted. 
making the employee dorms a safer place would probably go a long way, as well as raising wages so that the tough job of working at an amusement park is more competitive. And for anyone considering working at Cedar Point one summer, I say go for it. It should be a great time for you, and it'll also help the park staffing. Alright, thank you for watching everyone. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.